So welcome everyone to another episode of Live from My Drum Room, also the Modern Drummer Podcast. It's a pleasure to see you all today, and I'm very excited to welcome today's guest. I think we are guaranteed to break the internet today with, with this young man. Please welcome Matt Chamberlain to the podcast. Matt! Hey, what's up? <laughs> it's good to see you, brother. You uh, you, getting a little practice time in, too. That's good. Good to see yeah. that. I'm trying to work off that uh, iced coffee I just had. Um. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wish I wish I recorded our, our you know, our sound check, because that was some of the funniest stuff, you know, just that's usually how it goes. But anyway, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to see you, man. You Thank too. you for doing this. Thank you for having me. Well, I, I'm, I'm I, a little nervous to tell you the truth. I mean, oh, come on. You're yeah. not nervous. Yeah, yeah. I don't usually talk. I usually <laughs> do stuff with these things. <laughs> <laughs> you, let, you let those do the talking. I got to tell you, I'm, all right, total full disclosure. I, I'm, I'm more nervous today than I think I've been on one of these in a long time because, um, you know, the response to, to having you today has been unbelievable, not surprisingly. So many people are watching right now. And, and I, you know, I'm so psyched to have you. I, I started looking at all these things that I wanted to talk about. And it, it's like one thing, it's like peeling the layers off an onion mat. Like one thing led to, it's like you've played with so many people. It's crazy. It's crazy. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I know what happened. I know what happened. Here I am. I don't know. The mystery. <laughs> it's great to have. It's great to have you. And I have to tell you this: a lot of your friends are watching. Um, the young and handsome David Aberziz is watching right now, okay. and um, yeah, and he 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 has a he had a comment that I'll share with you later on. But he wanted wanted me to ask you about um, something. And anyway, but I'm going to just jump in if that's okay with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I'm going to just. Head first. I'm ready for it. Whatever it is, bring it all up. All right, man. <laughs> well, first of all, what an incredible career. I mean, I, I, I just said this a second ago, but looking at everything that you've done in the last 30, almost 35 years, 30 something years. And, and like I said, you're, you're, it's like, you're really almost kind of just getting started and, and, you know, to, I know that's a little bit of a, um, not an exaggeration, but I mean, you, you still have, you still have a lot more rim shots left in you. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, did you, when you, when you were, and you went to North Texas state, I, I know, um, I tried for, yeah, for a little <laughs> while. I know you <laughs> like a semester and a half. Yeah. I made it through a semester and a half. That's all. Okay. I thought it was longer than that. I thought it was, a, I thought it was at least a couple semesters. No, oh, like halfway semester. through the second semester, I, I kind of ran out of money because I spent all my grant money on drum gear. <laughs> 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 and and so I moved into da into Dallas because you know, um, North Texas is north about forty minutes north of Dallas. So yeah, I moved into this area of Dallas called Deep Ellum, which at the time was pretty sketch. And there were a couple clubs that were starting to open up and there was like a little music scene going on and it was really affordable. So yeah, I just moved down there and just started playing music. And um, I think that time period was like the most um, formative period for me as far as just learning and seeing music and being exposed to music. Cause you know, bands were always touring through that part of town and playing the little clubs that were there. And so yeah. being right out of college or basically, well, I wasn't really in college, I guess, like a semester out of college, <laughs> um, being in that mentality and then like going to a club and seeing bad brains or the butthole surfers, or there was a, actually, there was an, another club in Fort Worth called Caravan of Dreams that used to have tons of jazz, um, things. It was like part of the jazz circuit in the U S and I got to see like Art Blakey and Tony Williams and Man. Um, Jack DeJunette, Ronald Shan Jackson, you know, like Ornette Coleman played there a lot. Um, so that was a good time to be in Dallas, you know, that yeah. was like late eighties, like 87, 88. And you were just like 20, right? 20, 21 years old. 
Yeah. Yeah. And so incredible. I, I yeah. mean, seeing, you know, going going seeing Ornette Coleman and then seeing Bad Brains and then, you know, Reverend Horton Heats playing down the street every Monday night at his club. It was just like, what? You know? <laughs> yeah, man. I know. But... Rock of free jazz to rock, you know. What a, yeah, what a great time, you know, to 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 be around music, to be around these bands and, ha you know, be exposed to all that music, I should say. And yeah, it's so, so important in our formative years, you know, like at that point in your life, that's, that's, I don't want to say it's better than an education in North Texas, but it's, it's along that same level of, you know, what you're, what you can experience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you know, there were still all my friends from North Texas. So incredible musicians that just lived in the area. So everybody was always into playing. So I feel, I feel like that was probably more educational for me, just jamming with people, you know, like getting together and just playing. Yeah. I mean, obviously I still had all my drum books and I was able to like shed on stuff whenever I had time, but um, it was the playing that really. Yeah. It's gets you kind of in a thing, you know, and then being in bands and dealing with that whole dynamic of, you know, the whole other thing. <laughs> whole other thing. Exactly. So, so jumping back and it's funny, you mentioned when we were offline that you came up to DW, you think maybe in 1988 or maybe 89. And we, we may have, yeah, we may have met in 88, which is kind of would, it wouldn't surprise, would kind of blow my mind. But then again, it wouldn't because I'd go, geez, you know, like that's, yeah, because I remember we were still on tour with Edie Brickell like halfway through that year. And I was like, I need to get a DW kit because I remember we were playing some gig <clears throat> in like it was like Roskilde Festival or something, you know, out in Europe somewhere. And the opening band, the drummer had a DW kit. And I was like, wow, these drums sound so good. They sound so like uh, they had this like attack to them, this really cool like maple-y thing. I, mm -hmm. I thought I could, you know, like those are the only words I can think of right now to describe it, but it just felt very uh, immediate. It wasn't as mushy sounding as the, I, I forgot what I had. I had like a superstar or something from, from there yeah. like that. And so I called DW up, you know, went on, went, you know, like looked in Modern Drummer Magazine, saw the little ad, you know, Newberry Park. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we were in town and I went out there and I remember like John Good took me up into like a, it was like an attic and there were just all these shells and he was showing me how there was like notes stamped on the, the shells. But that was like 88. Yeah. 80, maybe the end of yeah. the week. That's wild, man. You might've been yeah, that no, I mean, I might've been there. And, and, and that's what we did too. I mean, like John would, you know, such a small operation at that point that he'd bring people in and take them for a tour and he'd let them pick the shells. Like, you know, these, and that's probably what you did. And, you know, you matched your shell so that you had the best, you know, you're going to have drums that will tune uh -huh. theoretically easier and, and more friendly um, with each other. And yeah. yeah. And, that, and that, I had like the little eight inch, I had like a little eight, 10, 12, maybe a 16 with a rack, you know, and the splash symbols and the, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I was obsessed with Manu Kache and Stuart Copeland. So, you know, I had a yeah, yeah. rig, you know, and I still, yeah. like, I'm still, upset. all right, well, I want to, I want to speak in a go ahead. That new Peter Gabriel, those new Peter Gabriel songs that are out. Yeah. So great. I, I love hearing Manu play. Okay. That's the end of Manu. No, me too. <laughs> I, I, I love, I love his playing. Absolutely. And I was just going to say a couple of quick things. All right. Your drums sounded so great on the Grammys a couple of weeks ago, I guess almost a month ago now, but, um, you know, and you were talking about Mike Clink, who who was the front of house guy, or he was the mixer for the for the TV feed, I should say. Yeah, yeah, he was out there in the in the truck doing the broadcast mix. Yeah, yeah. what a great sound! If if Mike happens to see this, kudos. I I bow to you, sir. Like you know, I I, I knew his name as you say as a as a producer, but yeah. yeah, yeah, he he did a great job. And those drum, I mean, those recording custom drums. Those are pretty great. I'm, I'm with the, you know, I've been with Yamaha now for about coming up on five years and um, Greg Crane, great Greg Crane. Yes. <laughs> gave, yes. Sent, sent me these um, recording customs and I was like, 
blown away. They just sound so great. I mean, of course they sound great. They're Yamaha recording customs. And yeah. um, he got he got me the kit with the 24, you know, 12, 13, 16, 18, and it's a monster. I love it. It's so much fun to play. They you know, I know what you're saying. It's it's um you know, their Yamaha recording customs, of course they sound great. They always do. But there was like some mojo to them that night. Even like maybe it was the way Mike mixed them really, really hot. I mean, really mixed them well into the mix. Like you could you were really heard. Um the Tom sounded incredible. You know, a couple of times when you did these big fills in the toms, like you heard every note so clearly, you know, really they spoke so well. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. We no, I mean it was hit or, it's hit or miss with those broadcast things because you know those guys have no time to get a mix together and you know there's a million bands and so yeah. and luckily luckily that all worked out that's awesome I, I and you guys you got to have a sound check that day probably right some a quick one maybe or yep. yeah 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 well great and and your symbols peisty symbols sounded great 2002s it looks like mostly yeah that i used all those those new um the 2002 black labels what are they what are they called big beat Big beat, yes. Yeah, yeah. Those are beautiful. Nice. I like those. Yep. Really, really nice. Well, I was gonna, I, I was gonna, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was just gonna say they're they're nice because they they still have that real nice high end to them, and they're a little thinner than the regular two thousand two. So if you play them real light, they still sound, you know, beautiful and not too clangy. You know. Yeah, yeah. They respond. Yeah. They open up quick. Yeah. No, I was just gonna jump back for one second and say that the. Um, you know, like when you were talking about on tour with Edie and, and that's when I first, you know, discovered who you were back in, I want to say around 89 and the, uh, you know, the video, the, the big video that was on MTV all the time. And, and you were just, you know, a young kid, 21, 22 playing traditional grip, mm -hmm. but there was obviously, and then I, I feel like it was a matter of a year or not much more a year or two later <clears throat> you were in Pearl Jam for a minute, for a little while, right? Mm -hmm. And then you had the Saturday Night Live gig. Like, you just you just like took off at that point. Yeah, with a how, crazy couple of years there. How did the, so? How did that? How did you go from like what was the transition from going from Edie's gig to Pearl Jam to SNL, for example? Well, I mean, Edie, we all we broke up as a band like we put out the second record and toured for a bit and i think we toured through like the spring and then uh we called it quits and that producer of the last ed record this guy tony berg um, um called me up and said hey there's this band in seattle named pearl jam that is doing a tour and they need a drummer to fill in um would you be into it and you know this, this was before the internet, of course, so that, you know, they mailed me a cassette <laughs> and I was like, sure, I'll go to Seattle and hang out. And, <laughs> and so we just did this tour in a van and um, it was, it was hilarious. It was so fun. It, um, but they were about to hit the road for like, I don't know, as long as a band does when they put out a new, a new record blow up, yeah. you know, so, and I quit a band that was on the road for, you know, three or four years straight. I was like, eh, I think I'm going to go, you know. Um, I, oh, and also at the same time, I got offered to move to New York City and do this SNL gig. And I was like, man, I, I want to go to New York and like take some drum lessons and just see if I could be a drummer that can play with, play on records and just like, you know, be a, an independent musician instead of just being in a band. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. And okay. I really worked hard towards, um, you know, I, when I moved to New York, I got a place and all I did was study. You know, I took drum lessons with tons of different people and studied and practiced and then did the gig and tried to go out and absorb as much music as I could in the city. And, um, and that was, that kind of set me off on my path of, what I've been doing, which is playing on records and um, just being involved in different types of music and, you know, the things I, I love doing, which 
is, is that, you know, yeah. more, more so than just being in a band and just doing that thing, you know? So that's what happened. Wow. So I, I did that yeah. with, okay. Penn, with Pearl Jam. Then I just moved to New York and got deep into drummer stuff. On, and was it, it was, it was different than like going to North Texas or like a, a, a music school where they had like a curriculum and they were obviously trying to mold you into like a music teacher or, or uh, you know, like that, that was kind of the deal at college, at least yeah. I thought at the time. And so, you know, being able to like be employed in a city like New York and seek out people to study with is awesome. You know? That's great, man. Yeah. That's, and who, who were some of the guys you studied with or who, who did you study with in New York? Like, um, the first guy I hooked up with was Danny Gottlieb. All right. So he was so sweet and nice and encouraging. And um, we would just get together and work on hand stuff a couple times. And he turned me on to, um, I think Master Studies had just come out, that book, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so I got really into working on my hands through him. And then, um, you know, and... And the other people that I studied with weren't necessarily drummers. It was like there was a guitar player that lived in Woodstock named David Torn, who is this experimental, amazing jazz. I don't even know if he's considered jazz. He's just more creative, interesting. Like, you know, he played with Don Cherry yeah. in the 70s. But he's done, he, he did this amazing record with Terry Bazio and Nick Karn called Polytown. You ever heard that? Okay, I've, that's how I know his name. Yes, yep. Absolutely. Yep. And he just kind of opened me up to like, uh, like sound, like sound. Cause he's into, he was like one of the earlier guitar players to get into looping live and kind of like sound design. And, mm -hmm. um, and I got really interested in trying to do that with drums and like making the drums sound different for different parts of the song, you know, like experimenting with, with that whole world, you know? Like, yeah. Yeah things and um so i could you know i guess that was kind of a lesson you know from him and sure and then just playing with people out there you know that was a big lesson and just practicing yeah. going out and seeing you know go, being able to go out and see like jeff watts play or um you know any of those guys that were playing at the time was so inspiring you know Absolutely. Yeah. Like a Monday night at, at, you know, smokes or, 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 um, any one of the jazz clubs. Yeah. Yeah. Or like being back, I saw like Jack DeJanette a handful of times with his trio with Keith Jarrett. And that was like being abducted by an alien, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as far as like you sit down and the music starts and then two hours later it's over and you're like, I don't know what, <laughs> but that was incredible. I don't even remember like, having to go to the restroom or anything for like two hours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got to say, I saw Jack last time I saw Jack do a clinic, uh, at like a, at PAS at a PASIC about 10 years ago. And you know, like, have you ever done a PASIC, Matt? I think you have, right? I did one around that time back in the, like 89 or no. Oh, wow. Well, okay. No, wait a minute. No, I, I just went there. I just hung out there. It was in, is it still in Indianapolis? It was in Indianapolis at the time. It it it's it is now kind of permanently, but it used to move around every couple of years to different places. And that was fun. Yeah. I remember, like Louis Belson was yeah. around and he was doing some stuff. And oh man, um, yeah, Louis. Well, I I was gonna say I saw Jack, and you know each each artist has like fifty minutes, less than an hour, to do their thing. And a lot of a lot of times, you know, the format it, you can do whatever you want, but a drummer will come out and they'll they'll open with a solo and then they'll take some questions from the audience and then they'll play a little bit more and they'll demonstrate. And Jack played for like a solid 50 minutes and it was like, you know, by himself. And it was just what you described. It was this I saw movement. That. I saw that. You did. It was the one where he comes out and he goes, I need you to turn the lights down. He had him turn the lights down and he just played yeah. free form drum solo for like an hour. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Cause that was back when people used to bring their little cassette recorders and record clinics and stuff. And I remember I re yeah. had that. <laughs> <laughs> that changed my life. That seriously did. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I know, I know it's, 
there there are like a few people like Jack that and Tony Williams was like that too. The few things like that that he did where he would just come out and play and he would build from, you know, starting from just like this double stroke roll. If you've ever seen any like YouTube yeah. videos of Tony, it's just like for like 10 minutes, you know, and the sweat's kind of pouring off his forehead and he's just, you know, that, That's you not, know. Right. Those guys are masters at improv. Uh, so some of the greatest to, to ever do it. Um, yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah. That was great. And it, and it's this whole, you know, uh, tension that they can create too. You know, these, like you say, these masters at this, they can, they can take you emotionally, you know, like to these different places during the, during that hour. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was otherworldly. And I, yeah. um, there was another thing, like it was drum, it was called drum days. Um, yes. Where's that one at? And oh. that was in, that was in Ohio. That was in, um, uh, Columbus, Ohio. And I remember there was one, that was one of the clinics I did. I did a clinic there where I just played with a, a bass player, but the person they were honoring that day was Roy Haynes. And um, that was also a life changing experience because they had his drum kit set up backstage, just kind of like in yeah. the hallway. And I remember walking by it and, um, and I saw his symbols and I was like, oh man, he must be playing like some old killer, like, you know, K's or something. And they were, they were just whatever backline symbols yeah. available. Yeah. And I was like, man, he's probably going to show up and change the symbol. And he shows up, they put the drum kit out on stage, same symbols. And he goes out there and, just, and everything just sounded so good. He just made everything sound good. Yeah. He <laughs> sounded like Roy. I know. Yeah. It's like that story I heard from Keltner. He told me about going to like one of his first sessions in LA where there were like tons of people on the session and so you could like sneak into the room and like watch, you know, and he, and this was, I think, right when he started doing recording sessions and it was like Earl Palmer or somebody like that was on the session. And so he got there, Kel Keltner got there early and he tapped on the drums and he's like, oh man, they're going to, he's going to tune these drums. They're going <laughs> to, and so Keltner just sitting there waiting and Earl Palmer shows up. He doesn't do anything. He just starts playing and they sound incredible. Yeah, man. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it, it's like I guess they just find the good spots, and that's what they do. They play the good parts of the kid or something, but or they just make yeah it good somehow. Um, that's that's a great story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I had Jim on with me a few months ago, and and that was an incredible time. You know, just I'll, I'll send you the link if you ever want to check oh, it I, out. It I was really it the other day. Oh, you did. I love. Oh, cool. I, any chance I get to talk to him or see an interview, I'm there. He's, he's like yeah. Yoda or something of drums. He just, I have a, a, an experience with him or had an experience with him where we were at Sunset Sound, I don't know, this was like 15 years ago. And he was in Studio 3 and I was in Studio 1, whatever they call it. And uh, he came by just to say hi. And I had some kit set up and he was like, oh man, let me check these out. And he sat down and he played them and I swear he made them sound an octave lower. I don't know what he, I mean, I didn't obviously didn't change anything. He just played them. And I was yeah. like, these drums sound huge. And then I sat down behind them and they sounded totally different. Wow. Like, I, I be totally believe that. <laughs> I know. Yeah. The mystery of the universe. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense because every drummer is going to hit differently and bring right. different sounds out of the instrument. I know engineers always talk about that. Like, you know, they can have one kit set up in a studio and have two or three different drummers play it. And it sounds totally different, you know, yeah. like internal balance, your dynamics, everything is different the way you hit. And then you, you yeah. add the, the Keltner, you know, magic to it. And it's like another takes it to another place. Yeah. So it's a mystery of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> so man, I'm, this is so great because I'm learning so much. Um, what you said earlier about when you moved to New York and I think did GE Smith like kind of invite you to, to be in the band at that time was he was the band leader and like he had heard you play or maybe you guys had done a record together maybe or no, you know, he, uh, I met him because on one of the tours, uh, with Edie that we did, we opened up for Bob Dylan. Ah, okay. He was in the band at the time and we just hit it off. I think yep. just, he, he would always just crack up at, Cause I was such a hippie back then, 
you know, like <laughs> it was schools and like my hair was down to my butt and <laughs> like, man, you're so hippied out, man. You know, you just, <laughs> you just <laughs> hang out and make fun of me or something. I don't know, but it, <laughs> 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 it, was, it was really fun to hang. I mean, and plus he's like an encyclopedia of blues guitar. So that was fun yeah. to learn from him. Cause I just didn't, you know, at that time, like back then, you know how it was like, if you wanted to learn about some music, you had to go to the record store or maybe you were lucky enough to see somebody live like Muddy Waters or, but if you yeah. want to get into the blues, you had to have a friend that had blues records or I just didn't know many people that were into the blues. So I mean, it's fun to hang yeah. out and learn that, but that's where I met him was he, he was playing with Dylan. I see. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, so I, I want to back up just a second too, because um, I didn't realize I, I looked, I saw it either on your, either on Wikipedia or maybe it was like your, your website that you took lessons. You studied with David Garibaldi as a, as a young drummer. Yeah. You know, I grew up in Los Angeles here and yep. when I was in high school and jun actually in junior high, before I even had a full drum kit, I just had like a kick drum and a snare and a hi-hat. And I went and took lessons from David Garibaldi. He was living out here like in Canoga Park. Canoga Park. Yeah. I lived in Canoga Park. He was my neighbor. Yeah. And I went out there and I remember he was, he gave me the first lesson was the paradiddles where you do the sound levels and accent, and then you displace the accent while you're reading notes with your kick drum over that. And that's what I worked on. And he said, you got to go work with, uh, or you got to take lessons from Murray Spivak. Um, who's the master of hands, you know, about Murray. Yeah, sure. Yes. Like yep. Murray taught Louis Belson and Chad Wackerman and a lot of orchestral percussionists. And, and, um, and he had like a three-year program you went through, you know? And so, but I, I didn't, I, I only went through a year because I graduated from high school and then went to North Texas, but he, yeah. he taught me a, his technique, which was, you know, the fulcrum is here on this hand and um but he was that's all he did was just hands and he was like 80 something years old at the time yeah and um i feel real lucky to have had at least a year with him because it was it was very educational i wish i would have made made it through the whole program with him but um that was enough for me in my uh or at least at the time but um yeah so i took lessons from him from, from Garibaldi, from Maurice Spivak, and then Chuck Flores was also around. You know about Chuck Flores? I do, yes, yeah. He, I would go to his house, and he just had a little practice pad set up, and he just had me work out a bass drum, bass drum control, doing um, stuff around the kit, more just like getting around, uh, uh, what do you call it, like independence kind of exercise. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I was kind of bouncing around with those guys, for a little bit and then i went to dave i mean uh went to greg bissonette's house for a lesson and he was the guy that completely blew my mind because i mean he i think he was like 22 years old at the time or something you know i was 16. And yeah he yeah had, he had a thing set up in his backyard with his drum kit and his brother was living with them and um he taught me how to like read charts you know big band charts and <clears throat> He gave me a sheet of paper with all of these um, influential records I should check out. You know, like that's yeah, like three quartets or every you know, like t Tower Power records or uh, you know. And I was like, wow, I've never heard of any of this stuff. I need to check it out. And um, he and he was the guy that encouraged me to go to North Texas because that's where he went. Um, so yeah, that was a good time because there were all these guys living in town. And you can, I just would call the musicians union up and go, Hey, can I have, or do you have uh David Garbali, Baldi's phone number? And I would go take lessons from him for a while. And then that's great, man. I even wow. went to Mark Craney's house. Remember Mark Craney? I do. Yeah. Um, I went Rest to in place, place, Mark. Yeah. Yeah. He, remember he had his, he was a lefty. So he had his drum kit set up left-handed. Then he set up another drum kit for me and I took a lesson from Wackerman. I think yeah. I, I transcribed like ship arriving too late to save a drowning witch. And I brought it to him and I was like, is this right? Did I do this? 
<laughs> I have no idea. I just, this is like improvisational. <laughs> you guys don't like play all these. <laughs> well, you, so you just answered a So, so you, you were pretty good and probably still are a pretty good reader. I mean, you could read pretty well back then having studied with all those great teachers and working out of these books. It helped a lot. Yeah. I mean, I got really, yeah. I got really into it. I mean, my, my goal back then when I was 16 was to play with this guy, you know, I wanted to play with Zappa. Yeah. I just was obsessed with Frank Zappa. You'd never know it by the records I played on. But. <laughs> well, yeah, no, that's, 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 that's really, really cool. That's very insightful because I was going to ask you like as a young drummer who some of your influences were like, and you mentioned Stuart Copeland and probably menu menu I'm guessing came later, but you were yep. probably into the police and. Yeah. It was like all the usual suspects, you know, like at the time, like it was, and you know, in the early eighties, I was into all the, the great drummers. I, I mean, there were a lot of great drummers in popular music, which was awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, everyone from Phil Collins to, Terry Bazio to, you know, Bill Bruford to just Neil all, Peart, probably. Of course, yeah. Neil Peart, yeah. Peart um, <clears throat> Bonham, I have all the classic rock guys. Um, I just loved all, you know, yeah, usual stuff. I didn't get into jazz till I went to college. I just didn't have any friends growing up that were into jazz, you know? Yeah. Um, and then, and so it was, it was, you get the gig with Edie. And like early twenties, right out of, you know, like basically a year or so out of high school and, and you're, you know, you're playing in a band that's, that had to have helped develop what I, what I look at, like, you know, your maturity, like you, you, you were playing so maturely for a younger drummer. Do you know what I mean? When I say that, like a lot of guys, I know when I was like in my early twenties, I just wanted to play a lot of drum fills and. I think it's a natural thing, especially for somebody like you who obviously had tons of technique, have tons of technique. And I think the fact that you were able to and chose to just, I just think that's incredible, Matt. You know, I think a lot of younger well, drummers could learn from your example. Well, thanks. But, it, you know, it wasn't just me. It was the guys in the band telling me to chill out because I used to. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. Just, just play. Okay, here's the verse and here's the chorus don't do a crazy fill just don't do it <laughs> I, you know i was 20 years old I, I was out of my mind i wanted to like throw down and play all the shit i liked you know and here yeah. were these songs that you know they just you know I, I don't know if you know this a lot of people think i played on the first record i did not play on the first record that was i i chris witten yeah i do yeah. know that yes and so so they went and did the record came back and um the drummer you know, quit. He was, you know, pissed off, obviously, because um, the producer replaced him with a studio musician. And um, and the bass player, Brad, was my roommate. And he asked me if I wanted to audition. And so I did. And um, and I joined the band. And But it, it took a while for them to, like, like chill me out because I was, you know, I wanted to play, like, five over two over seven, you know. <laughs> displacing the snares and like you know the guitar player hated me just like give me the stank eye all the time you know just like what the hell are you doing dude just chill out but that's what you do yeah. when you're that age i mean that's yeah right i mean yeah exactly and that's why i but that's why when i you know discovered you you know after the ed Brickell gig and like in the early 90s and you know you were doing the uh, saturday night live every week and then you started up showing, you started showing up in all these other records and you were this really fully formed, like mature studio player. And, and you kind of answered that question just in, in, in the conversation we were having when you said you moved to New York and, and decided you wanted to try to, um, cause I wondered that, like, did you make a decision in your mind? Like, I want to try to be a session guy or did producers start calling you and saying, I heard you on this record. I, I had you do this, you know, I want you to do this record with me like that how you took that step. Yeah. I consciously just wanted to be a part of records because I just love the process of record making. I just love it. I love, you know, I engineer a lot. I just, you can't see this. This is my recording studio. I have a, 
a room in um, the Sound City Studios complex. Yeah. And, um, Great. you know, I engineer everything here and I just love the whole process of it. I love um, learning and record. Drums are like my favorite thing to record. I think it's most engineers' favorite thing to record because it's just, there's so many possibilities with how to mic it. So yeah, that was a conscious decision. I wanted to play with songwriters and on records and get into that whole world of record making. I just yeah. I think it's so fun and um, it's so creative. It's it's more um, interesting to me than just being in a band, you know, which I mean, if you're in the right band, you can do some really cool shit, but bands are kind of like a self-contained unit of, it's like a little box, you know, mm -hmm. at least that's what I, I've always thought. But um, yeah, and so I just really wanted to, you know, I, I put myself out there trying to like tell people, yeah, if you ever have anything you want to record or just let me know, I want to come and do it, you know? And at the time I was just like, well, just buy me lunch or something. You know, I just wanted to learn because you don't learn recording. I mean, you, you, you learn recording by doing it. You know, you have to listen back to yourself. You gotta, you know, sometimes you don't want to play as loud as you do live when you're recording. You know, so mm -hmm. there's all kinds of variables going on and, and it's just, yeah. um, I love it. So that, that you, was a conscious decision for sure. Yeah. And you got comfortable with it pretty quick. I'll bet, I'll bet you really got, you know, like I, I'll give you an example. And I was telling my wife who says hello, by the way, Kelly Firth, my, and, and, um, she was very excited that you were going to be here with me today. And, um, but I remember, um, hearing the the wallflowers tune one headlight back when it was on the radio and 25 years ago turns out and i and i knew it was you i remember hearing that it was you on the record and totally digging it totally digging what you played and i and so today i was thinking i'm gonna listen to that i haven't listened to that song in a while like really listened i'll hear it on the radio but i put it on today and i thought if i remember correctly matt plays just bass drum, snare drum, hi-hat pretty much the whole time. I don't think there's really many fills in it. And sure enough, and I, you know, I encourage everybody at home watching this right now to check that song out because it is indeed, although I do hear one tom-tom, and this is the geek in me, there's a, a fill at like three minutes, 56 seconds where you do like a little and you hit just a, a quarter note in the tom-tom. But the beauty of it, Matt, is you don't hit one cymbal crash, right? I mean, throughout the song, it's all hi-hat, and it's all these little syncopated fills and it's it's so tasty i just i it just it's it's like what jim you know like it reminds me of the stuff that keltner does like this really tasty memorable stuff and then today i was getting my hair cut and it was playing on the spotify channel that my hairdresser had <laughs> and i said hey <laughs> i'm gonna have this drummer on my podcast later today she's like really she was very impressed yeah well thanks yeah anyway. well, you know how that came about i mean we were playing the song as a song that had you know the sections defined by you know a crash going into the chorus and yeah um and it was just the concept that um it came from i mean it's not a, it's not uncommon to um not play a crash i mean there's plenty of examples you know sure there's tons I mean, there's tons of records where there's no crash symbol but I remember at the time, the bass player, Greg, and I were really into that Tom Petty record, um, Wildflowers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that song, You Don't Know How It Feels? Yes. Steve Peroni. He doesn't, yes. hit, he doesn't hit a crash at all on that song either. And um, I was like, how about if I just don't hit a crash like Steve Peroni? And um, it just kind of worked. It worked, yeah. It, it, you know, it's just a concept. It's more like, a, it's just like, okay, let's take away some things that you would normally do and see if that helps the song. Cause the song just wasn't feeling right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So sometimes you have to subtract instead of add more shit, you know? Um, yeah. At least that's what we tried and luckily it worked out. So, and, and I, I had made a note to ask you about that. If that was something that like the producer had suggested or maybe Jacob, maybe the songwriter or someone had said, you know, which, which obviously happens all the time in the studio where they're, you know, 
someone had, you know makes a suggestion to the drummer or to somebody in the band. But that was your that was your idea. That was your you and the it bass was, players. Yeah, I was just I, I just thought you know I, I told Greg the bass player I was like, hey, how about if we just try something like where I just don't hit a crash like that Tom Petty song. And we tried it and we're like, hey, that that works. Let's just that's do great. That. Yeah. And I was I remember like T Bone Burnett produced that record and I remember telling him I was like, man, if you miss the crashes, we can just overdub them, you know. And he's like, no, I just leave it alone. Just leave it alone. Because I was going to overdub right. like some fills and crashes going into the sections. Um, but he was like, no, nah, just leave it like that. And I was like, all right, cool. <laughs> no, it's, it's yeah, and it's it's just such a great groove and it, it everything just works perfectly i'm going to read you a couple of comments um oh jimmy keegan's watching you you know jimmy keegan right mm -hmm. yeah maybe it's already been discussed but please talk about mark endert and the fiona apple production yeah well like on the first record i guess it would be the first record and i'd made a note of criminal too just yeah, just as, as an example of just some ridiculous playing, but but yeah, maybe maybe you could just talk about that for a second. Mm -hmm. Well, that record was also a process of, uh, you know, we would play it, you know, we'd play it live, and it just didn't seem special, you know, like the the producer at the time uh, really wanted it to be unique and different, and we just kept trying stuff and. Um, on that record, on those sessions, um, was John Bryan, who's become a well-known producer, soundtrack artist, and, mm. or composer. Um, and he brought, I remember he, at the time, he had just moved to LA, and whenever he would show up for a session, his cartridge would bring, like, drums and microphones and, like, clothes, because he wasn't living anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Clothes would show up and <laughs> boxes of microphones, just like weird, just like random. He had so many great drums. I ended up using a lot of his drums. So I was like, wow, you have like Radio King drums. And man. So he had a box of weird old microphones. And I I thought, well, let's make it sound like a because at the time this was like probably 90, 94 or something. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And that was when people were kind of getting getting into like drum loops on songs. And there was like this whole like lo-fi, like incorporating like hip hop breakbeat sensibilities into a pop song, you know, like Porter's Head at the time, or like some of those British productions, like Massive Attack. Yeah. And so um I thought, well, how about if we just mic the drums with this shitty mic that is just all mid-range and i'll just play it play it down maybe it'll sound like a drum loop or maybe we could chop it up later or something and make it loop and and we did it and mark ender the engineer put this it's like an american mic it's called a d22 you've probably seen them like in videos like they're very weird looking they're like it's a metal looking thing looks very sci-fi but he just put it in front of the kit like kind of right in front of the kick drum, kind of like right there. You can see the kick drum. Um, and then just compressed it and EQ'd it. And then I think there was a kick drum mic. And that was the drum sound. And so I just heard that sound in my headphones and just played to it. And that was an example of um, like when you hear the sound of it, you can't just play drums like you would normally play drums. You have to kind of be light on the cymbals because mm -hmm. the compression and the sound of the mic is so mid rangey and harsh that you got to really like maybe even tape up the cymbals and like muffle stuff down. So, cause it is, it, you know, if you, if you compress a mic, it just draws everything into it. So if you have ringy toms or anything on the kit that's rattling, it'll come out. So yeah. And then we just did a couple takes like that and we're like, wow, that's, that works. Let's have a song yeah. like that. And, 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 that, and that was, that was, yeah. I think there's a sound of like a like a click or something i think it's like an mpc click that's part of the drum performance that i think mark ender had in the control room and we just use that as like the click track but he just kept mm -hmm. it in the um the song as part of it it's almost like a cowbell kind of sound yeah yeah that's the, and 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 
to your point that ha- hearing that in your in your headphones like makes you play differently is what you're saying right it, yeah, yeah it's, it forces it's like, you to... it's like the same concept of like if you're a guitar player and you're playing with uh just plugged straight into an amp or versus plugged into like an effects pedal you're going to play differently you know like if it's like the effects pedal of drums you know having yeah compression or distortion or whatever it is if you hear it you're going to play differently based on hearing you know absolutely yeah i i want to read you just a quick comment um from dave abrazes again who uh, and he'd mentioned this to me in a in a message that uh, his first DW experience was on your kit in Seattle during his Pearl Jam audition. Oh yeah, I left. And, it there. Uh, I left it there because he was. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and he said they became my dream drums because of the experience of that kit. So. Yeah. You you helped a young drummer's dream come true. <laughs> Matt Chamberlain. Yep, that's what you did. Left. I remember when I unpacked the cases when I got him back. He had he left me some funny messages or the guys did or something. I remember there were like some pieces of paper with like pictures and things. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Maybe that. Was oh, I want to read that. I can't remember, but yeah. <laughs> I want to read your message from Lalo uh, Davila, who says uh, that he and Julie say hello. Oh hey. Yeah, Lalo was there at North Texas for my short stint. Yes, yeah. Part of my deal with going to that college was I had to be in drum line. And that was intense. I was, yeah, I bet. played snare drum and we that actually that year we went to the percussive arts thing and we won first place. No kidding. In the drum line competition. Ask Lalo wow, has like a, a VHS of that performance. I've been looking for that for forever because it was such an insane you know how those drum line. Oh man, yeah. And you you played snare drum. Yeah, and we man, yeah. we rehearsed like almost every night, and like it was insane. Like every weekend, every you know, it sounded good. That's that's like serious playing when when you're in that condition. Yeah, that's amazing. That's yeah. Lalo said, "Send me a dress. I will send it to you." He has it. So yeah, he has it. Yeah, I want to see that. So I, want to, I want to see my mullet. I probably had like a serious eight mullet. <laughs> <laughs> it was the eighties. It's it's forgiven. I think I, I think I had a ring for that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I I remember the, the video of like an eighty nine. I guess it would have been the Edie Brickell video. Video we were talking about what I am and and you looked like you were about. I mean, you have such a baby face anyway, but you looked like you were about twelve. I remember thinking you were like probably 16 years old, you know, and I think you had, you had really long hair, maybe a ponytail in that. Is that sound right? Likely, yeah. 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 Traditional <laughs> grip. During the era of, of hair farming, it was like a, <laughs> you know, you have your uh, historic era, <laughs> paleolithic era, and then you have your hair farming era. Like the eight, 82 and 95. <laughs> when hair I can't. was abundant. <laughs> <laughs> I I can't comment on that because I have my own my own skeletons in my own closet when it comes to that stuff. So, and plus nobody had yeah. to go get a haircut. I mean, if you <laughs> have like a girlfriend that had like you know clippers, actually, I need to get a haircut right now. But you know, yeah, it looks good. I could I can send you to my girl. She's yeah, situate mass. She's really good. Hook me up, man. Hook me I up. will. Um. Man, I, this is this is hilarious, and as just as I knew it would be, this is great. Um, I wanted to ask you a couple other things, and we're sort of like touching on this too. Like, you have such a great sound, and and you've already sort of answered it, being that you have this, you know, you're an engineer, and and you you know you really, I know you really focus on sound. And was that something that I think it's safe to say it's evolved over time? I mean, it, you've always played like bigger crashes, all right. That's sort of been like a Matt Chamberlain kind of trademark once you started recording that kind of became your sound. Maybe. Maybe. No. I I know like back in the nineties, um, I, I didn't really pay attention to like the size of the crashes. I just call them <laughs> I think I was endorsed by Sabian and I was like, Can I have a couple crash symbols? And they just sent they're like, What do you, what do you want? Like a sixteen or a seventeen? Because that was like the size, like that was considered yeah. a symbol, right? Yep. Um it wasn't until later that I got into larger, I think, 
I mean, I never, okay. it, yeah. it's weird. Cause I mean, now I'm so, I'm such a gear geek, but back then I just was happy to just get whatever I could get and it would work somehow. I don't know. Like, you know what I mean? Like ignorance is bliss kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, that makes, no, it makes perfect sense. It does. It does. Because I think, as you say, you've, you evolved as a drummer and as a, you know, your ears and everything else. And you, and you, be, I'm think what you're saying is that you started to really pay attention to getting the sound you wanted. You would mean using a, maybe a bigger crash symbol or a thinner crash symbol yeah. or, or just you know, a bigger bass contact with people that have different instruments that you could try out. Like, Oh wow. A 20 inch crash symbol. That sounds amazing. Um, yeah. You know, I don't know. Like we're, I just never was around like other drummers that i knew that were playing in clubs we all just kind of had what we had i don't nobody really cared really as long as it didn't crack you know because yeah you had to like have some money for food too and drumsticks <laughs> <laughs> exactly but once yeah recording it's... yeah obviously you're like wow okay the microphone's picking up this and it the way it mixes with the other instruments you know there's some some like i'm just rediscovering 2002s this week like they just sent me some and I've been recording stuff with them and they're such a cool symbol. Like, yeah, I always thought they were just really bright and um, just like too bright, but it, but if you play them really soft with like smaller sticks, you know, and they just sound beautiful. Like, you know, they kind of float above stuff above other, mm -hmm. hands, you know, especially if you have like a lot of guitars or synths, they just have that beautiful um, kind of high end that just floats above stuff. Are you playing thin, thin crashes, 2002s? It just changes all the time. I'm, I'm, well, the 2002s are just standard, but, but they're bigger. They're like a 20, I have a 20 and, yeah. and a 24 inch ride. And they say crash. They don't have like a, a weight designation on them. So you're crash. Yeah. But Cause I, I, I picked up some fins mm -hmm. and I totally agree with what you're saying as far as like the, the, they respond quicker and the any sort of harsh element I mean, I, I don't record like you do but i mean just for live use they really speak quickly and kind of get out of the way and but have a, a nice frequency that kind of rises above a lot of the noise that yeah, my bandmates it's make it's nice you don't have to like especially like the rides like you know with the 2002s or like the um like the uh, essentials the ones that vinnie helped design yeah the 602s the yeah two formulas they're nice because you don't have to like hit them so hard you can just kind of play them and they just sit above stuff in a really cool way yeah. i mean you know I, i've always been in the world of really um dark kind of symbols you know i have for a while and i still love that you know all the master stuff that peisty makes is you know totally fills that need for sure, but um, it's fun to have a company where they're they have extreme sound palettes, you know, like the signature stuff too, like the Stuart Copeland hi hats, these little twelve inch, super mm. crispy, like they almost sound electronic. I just I just love all that kind of stuff because you can use it in a track and um, you know just gives you a different sonic perspective, you know. Absolutely, I yeah. I, I was just gonna say, so we were talking about this offline. Um, when you came to visit Zildjian and I'm trying to remember when that was, Matt, it had to be over 20 years ago or maybe about that 20 early two thousands, early two thousands. Yeah. That was when John Bryan and I went out there. He, he brought his bag of old K's. Yeah. He was like, Can you these exact symbols. I need double. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> and I do. And that was, I, you know, I didn't know who John was at the time. And I, I did later realized like, you know, he, he's, he, you know, he's obviously a huge deal now, but he was certainly a big deal then. And you were, you were like so cool and so chill, but what I remembered and, and is that you kind of, um, really initiated something that helped Zildjian, I think in the long run, because you asked to have some thinner a Zildjian's made some thinner. Do you remember this? You said, can I get some, cause I said, you know, we can, we can fool around with some K's and you said, man, what I'd really like to get is some, some older sounding A's, like some thinner A symbols for recording. Yeah. So you remember that we laid some thinner for you and, and I was kind of blown away at how good they sounded. I didn't think, 
the A's weren't really sounding good in those days. They were too heavy, mm -hmm. and and we all knew that. And just making them thinner, you had these great, and that kind of planted a seed for a couple of years later. Zildjian sort of making a change to that to that line to make them thinner. So oh, cool. they owe you a big thanks. Yeah, man, I can give them my address. They can send me uh, whatever, uh, whatever they want. I need check. <laughs> <laughs> retroactive I think, I think gold bars as well <laughs> um, uh, yeah but but that was because of john bryant he he was such a, a collector of vintage symbols and obviously is a, a recording genius so i learned yeah. a lot from him um and just ha having you know just being around his collection of instruments i was like wow these old symbols are really thin and they record so beautifully, but they still have high end, you know, like some of these old A's from like the fifties and sixties are really thin, but they have a beautiful high end to them. You know what yes, I mean? Yes, that's exactly right. Over yeah. time they mellowed out. I mean, you know, a symbol that's like 70 years old is going to sound different than a newer lathed one it takes a while, but um, yeah, but that, that like opened my, my eyes to, the world of symbols just being around john and just being around yeah. old k's and stuff like that but now like old k's are so unattainable <laughs> you know like yeah. even if you had the money it's like really i don't think i'm going to spend three thousand dollars on a right symbol and plus all the and plus i think all the really good k's from like the 50s and 60s people probably played them because they sounded so good and they're all cracked or they're they, i was just yeah and, and a lot of them just didn't sound good, right? I mean, a lot of those old Ks. They were clunky. Yeah, it was yeah. hit or miss. So that, like all the ones that are left over are the clunky ones probably because nobody played them and cracked them. <laughs> I, I, you know, I hate to say this to, to hurt my friends at Maxwell's Drum Shop that have a, a pretty sizable collection, but I've picked through them. And there's a couple of good ones that they have, but they're huge money. But to your point, Matt, I think most of the really good ones have either been and they're in someone's collection or they're just no longer around yeah yeah you know, steve gad cracked them you know <laughs> yeah he's the good ones man i remember yeah you know but i think we're like in the golden era of just like if, if you want a symbol that sounds like those old k's there's plenty of new yeah. new options from everybody you know so exactly yeah, yeah. You can find it. so Lalo just told me he emailed me at my Zildjian email. That has been defunct for 10 years, Lalo. <laughs> I will send you my, my current email. Um, if it's okay, Matt, I'll give him yours, and he can just send that picture to you. Yeah, great. He, says oh, he, he's, he has, he, the, he has the, a picture or a video? He said, I just emailed you a picture to your oh. Zildjian email. Okay. But maybe, maybe he has a video, too. Oh, man, I want to see the video. I'd love to yeah, see yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I wanted to ask you, you know, where, as we... We've been going for a little while now. I don't want to keep you all day here, but the process now. So when you get called to do a record now, is it typically, and you do a lot, I'm sure a lot of remote recording and, and do you do mostly stuff out of your studio or do you do well, still a fair amount in studio, other studios? You know, like when the pandemic hit, like everybody, I was stuck in my studio or, yeah. at, or your room or whatever. And so I just, I ended up doing a ton of records where I just did everything myself and got really, really into it because there was nothing else to do, obviously, during the pandemic. So um, <laughs> I feel like I, I got better as an engineer and just being able to like do it all myself because I had to. And um, and so like I have like a whole thing now, like, uh, like you can't see it on this side. I have like a whole percussion overdub Tom world and then... And I have a drum kit set up and then off over here, I have like another kind of minimally mic drum kit that could be more like a little jazz kit or percussion, more percussion stuff. So uh, now I feel almost a little bit more creative. Like I'm, I feel more creative having more options around. So yeah. sometimes I tell people, let's just do it at my studio because I can do more. And then in my control room, I'm, I'm really into like modular synths and, and drum machines and stuff. So I have a lot of options for doing hybrid acoustic electronic things. You know, if, if somebody wants to get a little more um, experimental. So 
I, I, I mean, I love doing it here and, and it's a different thing than just going to the studio, which there's still sessions like that where, you know, the cartridge brings my drum kit in and we play, you know, and I just play drum, I don't have to engineer, which is really nice now to, you know, I just play drums and then we order yeah, punch. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't have to sit there and make playlists and pro tools and like <laughs> A's is right on um, mics or you know it's uh yeah but both are both are going on now and I think now that we've been through the pandemic people are realizing that you can get really great results remotely too you know yeah um, yeah and when you do your your remote recording so you you do a you do a, a session in your home studio are you sending them fully formed tracks like mixed or are you sending stems or are you sending like you're and you're you're giving them like a, a finished drum sound usually what oh, i do is both. um I, like they'll send me the songs and i'll i'll do my first take of what i think uh, you know of, of my first impression of the song um and then i'll make a little rough mix and email it to them and say am i going down the right road like with sounds and approach like is this something you were thinking or, and you know if it's not then we get on the phone talk about it um if it is then i'll just continue doing takes and i'll just add more stuff you know add some percussion or i'll try it you know i'll just throw stuff at the song and see if because you know in pro tools they can use it or not obviously so yeah you know if i'm hearing something i can try it and just have it there and they can choose to use it or not so um yeah that's that's usually the process um i had done some sessions during the pandemic where i used this plugin where they give a stereo uh feed of what i'm hearing via the internet i sent them a, a link it's called audio movers and then we get on the ipad and so they're looking at me um you know they would mute their side of the ipad while i'm playing and then when i'm done with wow. the take they unmute the ipad and we can talk and it, it, yeah. it was funny because it was just like being in the studio to me because usually i'm in a in a room somewhere apart from the control room yeah i'm like can you hear me what is, what? <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> I? and so um it felt like i was in a normal studio but you know it was with people like in new york or like i did a tori amos record and they're in um cornwall england um and we would do that do it like that and um so there uh, yeah i think there's a lot of ways to do records you know if you're going to do that kind of record i mean obviously some yeah. people want to get in the room together and, and play and that whole thing which is way yeah. more fun than sitting around your studio by yourself <laughs> talking <laughs> to yourself i talk to myself a lot i do too yeah. no I, I, uh, I'm the only one that listens to me. So let's, yeah, yeah let's, I'm kind of forced into it, but, um, so in those situations, they're, they're like maybe sending you demos or, or, um, whether or maybe even in both situations, I guess, if you're like, if you're going to do a Tori Amos record or Brandy Carlisle, you have an idea what the, what the structure of the tune is before you record it. Obviously it's not like it's being written in the studio, so to speak. Yeah, if they're going to send me stuff like, for instance, like with Tori, she, you know, we've done so many records together for so many years that um, she trusts that um, if she just sends me a piano and a vocal to like a click track or a loop, that I'll get enough information to do something. Yeah. And it's, you know, with her, it's like super wide open. It could be anything, you know, and she's, yeah. Yeah. So, but obviously the song is arranged in a way. So I just learned the form and just try to make the song work with the drums or the percussion or whatever, you know, whatever ideas I have. And then I just send her little rough mixes of what I'm doing and she'll, she'll get back to me and go, yeah, or no, or. <laughs> <laughs> but probably more, yeah, more often than not, I'm sure it's a, it's a yeah on the first go, right? I'll bet given your history and. I mean, like sometimes there's options, like, you know, there's some songs where I'm like, well, um, here's more of like an electronic acoustic kind of vibe. And then here's more of just acoustic drums doing a performance of the song. You know, there were mm -hmm. some of those kind of options. He always went for the performance over like the more produced 
you know, here's a drum loop and a drum machine. And, you know, she just wanted me playing drums, which was, which was awesome. But it's fun for me to just try both ways because you never know. You know, you never know what could happen. Because, you know, with songs like that, somebody just sends you a piano vocal, it can go anywhere, you know, because you don't yeah. even know what yeah. instrument you're going to on it after the fact. I don't, you know, I didn't know if there was going to be layers of guitars or an orchestra or it was just piano and drums and percussion. And, but um, yeah, it was all based on, you know, whatever she used was based on what she was hearing her song being. So I just kind of went along with, you know, I just trust that she'll pick the right thing as her music. Yeah. I'm just yeah. innocent advice. I'm just here to help if I can. <laughs> <laughs> No, you know, I, I had made a note, I mean, stating the obvious, you're, you're a song drummer, you know, to me, the true meaning of a song drummer, you know, serving the song, um, you know, we talked about Jim Keltner, we, I think of guys like, you know, the late great Hal Blaine, you know, and we, we talked about Earl Palmer and offline, Ooh, and, I got or maybe it was, not, not to throw that? you off top, no, it's oh, okay. I just have a, I'll blame story for you, but I'll let you, I don't want to throw you off your. your no, thing, no. And but... I was going to, I was going to mention like a Dave Maddox too, who, who sent a very nice comment saying, you know, like, you know, you're one of the best and, and uh, yeah, but let's, I want to hear the Hal Blaine story. Hal Blaine story. Yes. Um, Got to hear it. Call me up and he was like, Hey, I have Don Bennett. I mean, I have uh Hal Blaine's um, a set of symbols. I guess he got it from Ooh. Hal's family. And he was wanting to sell it, but he was like, hey, I want to send these to you before I sell them just so you can play them, which was so nice of him. Yeah. And so he sent, and I had Hal Blaine's cymbals. I had his, again, like 15 inch hi hats. Uh, it was like a 21 inch ride, a 20 inch symbol that somebody wrote phallic symbol on. <laughs> <laughs> Probably Hal. <laughs> And uh, I, I think uh, that was it. it. Might have been something else. But so, anyways, I had his set of symbols on my kit wow. for that whole. And um, I was so excited. I was like, "Man, I can't! I can't believe it!" So I called Jim Keltner up because I knew that he got into doing sessions because of Hal. And I was like, yeah, "Man, I have yeah. Hal symbols here. Um, I'll just drop them by, and you can have them for a while and play them." Because he he told me some story about how. In like 1961, Keltner sat down behind Hal's kit and played his ride symbol and said it was like the best sounding ride symbol he'd ever played. Like he still remembers it to this day as like the best sounding ride. And so I was like, man, I think I have the ride. You know, you should check it out. Wow. And he, he had it for a couple of weeks and I was like, so what do you think? He's like, huh? He might have had another set of symbols. I don't, I don't know if <laughs> <laughs> you know how mics are. Mike's pick up symbols, you know, and we're trying to figure it out. Like, cause, it, cause it said how number one, like all the symbols had his name and it said number one on it, like his number. Oh, one set. but maybe he broke some symbols, but they're all like fifties, fifties A's. Yeah. Like thin 15 inch A's, a 21 or 22 A from the fifties. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, so, and I, th I thought he had a 17 inch crash too. Maybe, maybe that might've broken though. Yeah. And, um, and was one, one, a rivet was the, was the other like 20, did it have a rivet in it maybe or rivets? Maybe. Sizzles. It had holes in but, it. Yeah. It might've. Okay. So yeah. You know, the song, um, by the association, never my love. Mm -hmm. He used it on that song. If you listen like the, the opening do, 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 do. Uh, that's a great, I love yeah it. and it, check that out it's it's that's that symbol it's just I magical picture of those symbols let me see if I can see what they were uh, but what a cool thing to just to for Don to say that to hey I'm um, you know it was so nice of him. I was like are you yeah. sure I mean those are like priceless if they get lost um I don't know but I got him back to him he has them yeah they're, they're, that's he great still has them I don't think he sold them those would be something for like the rock hall of fame or like some, you know, somewhere where people can like see them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I saw Don, Don came out here to Boston, um, came to my house a couple of months ago. He was out this way to do some work for Aerosmith. 
And uh, we had dinner at this local restaurant, and I hadn't seen him in a while, and he's such a great guy. And we got to hang, and, and I'm, I know your name came up because I said, I want to have Matt. And I think I said, I think I still have all his numbers and stuff. And before I reached out to you after the Grammys, I think I verified. I said, I still have this number for Matt. And he said, yep, that's still good. And so, and then I saw the t- a text thread that we had anyway. So, um, oh, cool. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've known Don, I mean, from my years of living in Seattle, he was like the guy that always had the cool vintage drums lying around. And I go out there and I'd be like, okay, I'm not going to buy anything. Then I end up buying. <laughs> <laughs> he had you just where he wanted you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, had, I bought like, I remember when Elvin Jones passed away, he was um, helping Elvin's wife sell a lot of Elvin's stuff. And yeah, I picked yeah. up a, a pair of sticks and some brushes and the Elvin oh, great. jazz machine front bass drum head from him. Yeah. It's like, oh, man, so that's, that's so cool, Matt. That, so you have that, you have that bass drum head that, oh, that's, that's awesome. Has the Camco logo on it. And yeah. Elvin yep. and here, I'll show it to you right now. I'll grab it. That's man. Hold on a second. Ta-da! there it is yeah look at that yeah what a force of nature he was oh man was he ever yeah i got to meet him once you know michael shreve and see yes was good buds with him he was like interviewing him for something i think he was going to do like a documentary or something on him but um he had a, a, you know, jazz, jazz alley in Seattle. Yes. Yep. I saw him there Elvin, once. Yeah. Yeah. Elvin was playing and, and Shreve arranged for all the local Seattle drummers to go before the show and just meet him. And I was so nervous. Wow. Was, oh my God, it's Elvin Jones. And so I, I, I met him and I was like, can I just ask you one question? Like, what was your first recording session? Like, like how, like what? Do you remember, like, did they mic all of it? Like, what did they do? And he was just like, man, they just had one mic in the room. That was it. That was it. <laughs> it was wow. <laughs> He's like, and then he went off. He was like, nowadays, you know. Yeah, yeah. Drummers have to play for the engineer and all, all this stuff. And I was like, that's classic. That's exactly yeah. true. I mean, what happened? Exactly true. <laughs> if you would ask him, Matt, if you would ask him, Elvin, can you give me any tips on, on, uh, on sight reading, on reading music, his answer would be, get a light for your music stand. <laughs> is that, is that uh, actually what he said to somebody? He, he said that, he said that somewhere, someone said, do you have any tips on, on reading? And he said, yes. You know, and he had that, that voice. He said, you know, he'd hesitate to go, yes, <laughs> get a light for your music stand. <laughs> Oh man, I, that guy was, you know, a force of nature, just like you said. That's the perfect description. He was, and a beautiful human. Yeah, through and through. He so yeah. happy when he played. He was so joyful. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's a funny like Elvin connection in Seattle because, uh, you know, Greg Keplinger. But, sure. Yeah. Um, he's a good bud, and Keplinger saw Elvin play with Coltrane when they recorded live in Seattle. Wow. And um, he remembers it being like, like going to see a punk rock show or something. He said the, the velocity of sound coming. I mean, it, there was no PA system, you know, it was just them in a room playing. Yeah. He said it yep. was insane. Like the, you know, the energy. I believe it. Yeah. Because you know? Elvin played even in his seventies with such, you know, not like power and intensity, not, he didn't bash obviously, but just, he had this, this, you know, intensity, the way he played, you know, and, and like Billy Cobham, you know, you you could just volume and muscle and yeah. Right. Yeah. Just, yeah. Those guys are in tune with some other thing, some other force out there. Absolutely. Well, I, I appreciate, we've been going a long time and I so appreciate your time in doing this, Matt. I, we could go longer and longer. I want to just read a couple of quick comments okay. uh, for some, from some friends. Aaron Comis, 
mm-hmm. wanted me to ask you. I don't know if he was able to join the broadcast. He might. He was going to try, but he might not be here. Uh, but he wanted me to ask you about late night um, gig at Guadalajara's late night hang after the gig at Guadalajara's Mexican restaurant. Munchies back in the Dallas Deep Elm days, and um, just good times. He wanted me to mention that to you. Good old, good old Aaron. Yeah, that and was- uh, you know, Aaron lived in Dallas during that time. He lived down the street from me. Yeah. I remember him telling me that. Yeah. And yeah, he you was, guys, he's uh, around the same age ish, I think. Yeah. 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 Some good drummers came out of that part of the world during that time. Man, like Earl Harvin, you know, Earl Harvin. He was, I, I don't know him. I, I know the name. Yeah. He ended up moving to Berlin, but um, he played in, in uh, like Lucille and Air. Yes. And, um, yeah, he's just an amazing drummer from the yeah. Dallas area. Yeah, that's great. And um, yeah, Brett Brett Zwier just said, um, gifted musician with a great groove. Ask him about playing with Sunray and the tambourine machine he used on Mistress. Never seen one with a pedal. I probably should have asked you that earlier in the in the show, but um, oh, Sunray. Oh, yeah. That was actually across the parking lot here. That was uh, Matt Wallace. This producer was doing this series of getting musicians together to just play and he'd video it. And um, that guy Sunray, that thing that's on YouTube, that performance is the first time I ever heard those songs. I That's why I had that look on my face. I'm just kind of going, uh, <laughs> is this the next section coming up? Or like, you know, cause literally <laughs> I never heard that music before until we started playing it. I was, I was looking at him like, is this where we're gonna, are we stopping? Are we gonna keep going? But I have this tambourine machine um, that has a pedal like a it's, it's a dw uh cable hat hi-hat pedal attached to yeah yeah uh, chris hewer uh modified for me you know chris hewer uh, yep from guru my Tech guy in la yeah yeah he from guru exactly yeah he, he always he can do crazy shit and i figured he he'd be the man for the job but he, he just hooked it up i have it right here i can show it to you if you want to geek out on it Sure. Yeah. Yeah. If it's not too much trouble to. Yeah. Let, me, let me just grab it. Okay. So we have the tambourine machine. Which is wow. nice. And so um, he hooked up this cable hat to it look at that so there's like a little attachment here so it just goes down but um but the, the pedal does it i dig yeah and it looks like it feels pretty good too right the action's pretty yeah. i got it made pretty smooth i got it made for like a for a tori amos tour and we um and you know the the instrument has like all these arms on it you know it's kind of hard to see right? oh yeah i can see yep and so yep. and so for the that tour, yeah for the tour um i i had it out on tour and we had to like get different people to weld shit back together because it was falling apart and, um but I was getting into like taking pictures of people's faces and like photocopying their face onto a piece of paper and sticking their little head up here. So <laughs> it had little arms like <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> yeah. uh, uh, you gotta have fun on the road, you know? <laughs> like a little oh, sick arm Shiva kind of thing. <laughs> that's great oh man oh matt man this has been awesome man it's been such a pleasure chatting with you today thanks man it was a good hang i feel like you're here i feel like we're just i do too yeah i know i know and i was gonna you know you're mentioning campcos i got a vintage kit that i just got a couple about a month or so ago now and uh it has that same logo head that elvin had on his so i'm i'm yeah i I'm think feeling that, like i'm uh, was that like the seventies Camco when he played Camco? It was in the seventies, right? Because he was doing Gretsch in the sixties. 
Yeah, I think that Camco was the version that Tama ended up um, making. Tama had bought the name Camco, which they still own, and DW bought all the um, machinery and the designs for the lugs and all that stuff. So ah, all that's right. how that, yeah. That's a weird lug for a second, right? Like between. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. They had a, an, like a weird looking half rounded lug, the, the Tama version of Camco. Right, right. Um, so, so, and Elvin was one of their guys for a little while while they had them. Yeah. 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 Those old Camcos sound great. I found a little 13, 16, 22, and a 24, like a 60s um, Oak Lawn kit that I love. I love it. Wow. Wow. Um, I'm well, like, you know, we have to. I'm looking for other toms for it. So if anybody out there has like a 12 inch beat up tom or a 18 inch floor tom, let me know. <laughs> okay. You know what, Matt? I'm serious. When we when we finish the show, I'm going to connect you with a guy named Bob Saul, who got me this kit and got me the snare drum. The snare drum's an oak lawn. The rest of the kit's a chanute, which was the, yeah. the you know right after that 71. Um, he'll find you what you're looking for. I'm telling you, he can. He's the man. Bob's the man. He's the Camco hunter. He can find he's it. He's the cam. I have him on my phone as Camco expert. Whenever he calls me, it I, it comes up. Wow. So. Okay. Yeah, man. I would love to find a extra Tom or two for this kid. All right. He's he's the guy, the Camco whisperer. I'm going to yeah. connect you guys. <laughs> awesome. Um, and and I, I'd love to have you to do something in the future. I do. I'm going to start this new series called Track Talk where I just talk, we talk about like one song and um, the first one is going to be Monday. I'm going to have Stan Lynch come on and talk about stop dragging my heart around the Tom Petty, Stevie Nicks tune. And um, so down the road, I'd love to have you back either for this or for a track talk episode. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and just, I'm always into talking about drums anytime. I know. <laughs> I love that about you. All right. Well, hang, hang tight, Matt. I'm going to end the broadcast and I'll, come right back to you in the room but big hand for matt chamberlain everybody thank you so much for watching